So, um, I suppose to contextualize what I'm talking about in terms of procuring uh, a building or procuring architecture, um, we can see it, uh, as part, uh, we can see the entire process as three steps. Yeah, so um, uh, in order to produce a building, we have a design stage, uh, we have a procurement stage, and we have an implementation stage. So design, we're quite familiar with design, is what we do uh, in the design studio and also in the technology studio. Um, that's number one over there. Number three, implementation is the process of actually making, constructing or building um, a piece of architecture from a documented design, um, which leaves uh, number two, procurement. Um, so for us, in terms of the construction industry and in terms of architectural projects that are constructed, procurement is the process of buying a building's uh, construction. Um, now, what yeah, may you ask is the difference between buying and procurement then? Why do we use the term procurement? Essentially, procurement um, is, uh, is a term that uh, recognizes the complexity of the process of, uh, of getting something, getting a piece of architecture built. Uh, for example, it's much more complex than uh, buying a pair of shoes. Um, if we're going to talk about pro procurement in terms of shoes, it is uh, much more like arranging for a pair of shoes, the design of a pair of shoes to be uh, manufactured um, for a specific client, maybe a department store, what have you, and large numbers of it. Okay, so it's really got to do with uh, complexity. Uh, the, in, the Oxford English Dictionary um, defines one of the definitions uh, of the English, uh, of the Oxford English Dictionary of procurement is to, um, quote, obtain, especially by care and effort, uh, unquote. And uh, Acumen, uh, the practice notes for architects, says that Quote, procurement is the act or process of bringing about or bringing into existence buildings. It may also refer to the acquiring of buildings already existing, but most commonly it refers to the total process of bringing into being a building that was not there before and embraces all the activities that might be necessary uh, to the objective. So uh, in architecture, uh, the term procurement is uh, used to describe the contractual relationship between the stakeholders uh, to get the uh, design constructed. So um, I'm not specifically talking about contracts per se, and um, uh, but uh, contracts are part of it, and we will talk about contracts uh, um, in in a, in a future lecture. Uh, needless to say, what we need to keep in mind now is that construction contracts need to be able to cope with the process of procurement. So, um, in terms of the procurement uh, process for architects, uh, there are usually three parties involved uh, that you can see on the screen. Uh, the uh, uh, proprietor or the client, or also known as the principal, uh, the builder or contractor, and uh, the architect or legal consultant. Now, these three parties are usually separate uh, groups or individuals, but really one person could do all three roles, uh, such as an owner builder who designs, um, procures, and implements um, a project uh, by themselves. It is, it is important to note that um, architects are, are not always involved uh, in this process. Uh, so when you've got perhaps uh, class 1A buildings in the ACT, uh, you may have a homeowner who designs uh, the uh, uh, extension or, or the house by themselves and then uh, um, gets, the, uh, gets the building built by themselves, arranges for everything themselves. And this is a very old-fashioned sort of uh, uh, method, I guess. Now, in the pre-modern period, and with the uh, vernacular architecture today, which is still widely practiced across the world, um, one person did all three roles, much like your own builder did. So it does not mean, mean that they did absolutely everything uh, of everything, but that they did a lot of it, and certainly they organized uh, for what they didn't do uh, to be done. So if you take the, the example of uh, of uh, 19th century uh, vernacular buildings in Borneo. 
Um, with the one, with the example below, which is the Malay house, really what you would have had is that a homeowner who, uh, where's my glasses, who went on to uh, uh, get the materials for a house uh, and to build a standard design uh, which was culturally defined. Okay, and they did, uh, they got all the materials and they um, undertook all the construction uh, themselves. Perhaps uh, with, with, uh, with the help of, of, of their relatives or their community. Um, now, in the case of uh, uh, longhouses in Borneo, Ivan longhouses in Borneo, like the image on the top, um, this becomes much more complicated because you've got a very large uh, building of, of, uh, up to, of up to 100 slices, if you like, 100 apartments, uh, which needs to be built at the one time. So what happens here is you actually need a much uh, a greater level of organization and collaboration between all the different people uh, who live uh, in that structure, which, uh, which may not uh, be related to each other. So in this case, you can see that there's uh, probably going to be someone, well, there is someone to lead the process called the head man, who, who uh, the leader of, of, the, uh, of the longhouse who organizes all the other house owners that in order to, to, uh, uh, for people to make sure that their materials are available, they may do this individually or as a group, and then to make sure everyone is, is around to be able to, to, to build uh, these things. So in this case, uh, the uh, construction of a longhouse very much represents the uh, social structure okay, in, uh, that, uh, that these groups, uh, of these groups, now, in a more um, in a European context or Western context, um, we uh, see that a similar process happened. I guess you could say that this was an example I'm about to talk about. is a is an interim example. So, before um, the early professional architects such as Alberti, uh, you get the same kind of traditional organization, uh, which is reflective of the uh, social structure. So uh, we've got the uh, patron or the client, uh, and then we've got the builder or the architect. Remember in the, in the first lecture I talked about uh, builders also being architects. Um, uh, and uh, those relationships between the, the patron and the builder um, uh, were often blurred. If we look at the example of the eastern end of uh, the Romanesque Saint Denis uh, Cathedral, um, which was uh, renovated by the uh, Abbot Sugier in 1144, and this, of course, is a picture you see on the screen, one of the earliest uh, uh, Gothic cathedrals uh, ever built. Now, this this is an interesting um, example. You see, um, uh, Sugier was the head abbot of, of the cathedral. Uh, but he was also the architect uh, and the builder. So he was architect, uh, client, and builder, much as uh, um, the um, examples uh, in Borneo that I showed before of the Malay House. Um, it's slightly different, though, because he managed the processes of each role rather than doing it single-handedly. So you can see this, this uh, because of the complexity of, of the project, this was necessary. Um, so you could say that he was the construction manager rather than the builder. Um, he does. He didn't actually swing any hammers. He didn't get up there on the tools, but he organised for for uh, different uh, workers, uh, skilled or otherwise, to, to get the construction done. Um, the church was heavily connected to the uh, kings of France at the time, and, and it was financed by the royal families as well as by the senior clergy of the church who controlled the church's money. So he was part of that system, but it wasn't his money. Um, he got it from, uh, from the, the greater networks. Um, and then uh, they, in turn, were funded by contributions from the congregations, including uh, other nobility. So uh, these people need to spend their money on something. Cathedral seemed to be a good idea. And also, you know, there was the uh, idea that one might be buying glory to, bringing glory to their religion, buying salvation, and so on and so forth. Mm. Now, fast forward to a modern example, which is the Villa Sevoir of uh, 1931, um, for which the architect was the uh, office of uh, Pierre Jean-Ray and uh, 
and uh, local Busia. Uh, the clients uh, in this case were Pierre and Eugenie Savoy or Savoy. Um, while uh, Pierre was a partner in an insurance company, uh, it was Eugenie that, that drove the project. Uh, she decided on the brief, and, and she was the one who, who dealt with uh, the architects and, and um, approved the, the designs. So when we read modern histories, we know this. Um, when you do something as simple as, as Google the project, these names will always come up. Villa Savoir, the house of the Savoir, so the clients are there. Um, uh, Corbusier is there because his firm was involved. Uh, but the builder is never mentioned in this. Uh, we do know that the project was tendered and a contractor awarded, uh, and therefore we know there was a building contract. We know there was lots of problems with the building, uh, but we don't know who the builder was. We even know that there were two builders. We know that one builder was fired, and, and uh, that uh, uh, second builder was, was commissioned. But uh, we don't know who the second builder was. Even going to the house and and uh, and talking to the people there, they don't actually know either. So it's, it's kind of a curious thing and, and really uh, forms an incomplete picture, if you like. So, uh, what we need to do when we're considering these things then is to consider all the parties involved uh, in this process. So, um, Procurement involves building contracts, uh, and, and the building contract lays out uh, who the uh, main um, people are uh, involved in this procurement process. Uh, the main signatories are the client and the contractor, important people, and there are other stakeholders in the contract, including uh, the lead consultant, often the architect, as well as the sub-consultants and sometimes the subcontractors. Now. Um, We'll go through uh, the contract documents in, in, a, in a later uh, lecture, but uh, essentially what the contract describes is that uh, the client uh, pays for the construction, the builder um, actually does the construction, and then there's other people like the architect who, who provide the, uh, um, the documents and organize the permits and so on and so forth. Now, it's interesting to note that in the Commonwealth, or in the British system, um, our tradition is that contracts and construction are usually adversarial. Okay, so keep this in mind, we'll be, we'll be talking a bit more about this later. But basically it means that uh, um, uh, the contract uh, always assumes that, that, the, uh, that the main signatories, the client and the builder, are going to be at each other's throats, are going to be um, challenging each other at every turn throughout the process. Um, just a bit more about procurement. Um, according to Acumen, procurement is the act of process into the bringing about or bringing into existence buildings. Uh, we'll just say that uh, procurement is a term that, may, that can be used within uh, many industries and disciplines. Uh, so it's important to note that uh, 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 the terminology surrounding procurement can differ from one profession or discipline uh, to, to another, so we have to uh, be careful uh, when, we're, when we're looking at um, these sorts of matters. Now, um, there are many different uh, procurement methods and, and we'll be talking about uh, a few today. So uh, the first one, in-house or direct managed, we've already spoken about uh, in terms of the vernacular houses, uh, but also in terms of um, uh, in terms of, of the uh, Gothic Cathedral at Sondadin that I talked about before. Um, the uh, in-house or direct managed uh, form of procurement is, is not really used very much. The last time it was uh, used was probably in the 1990s uh, when uh, governments and large corporations used to have an architecture department who designed it, they funded it themselves and they actually went and uh, got the building built themselves. So the actor that's the client, the architect, and the builder. Okay, and, and uh, what's, what happens nowadays, this still happens uh, overseas, but this does not happen very much at all nowadays on a large scale, apart from the other builder in Australia. So, um, <clears throat> just to uh, go through the list of two to six there, uh, really, what we are most, what architects are most familiar with is, is what you call the traditional design and build method. And, and uh, 
uh, design and construct, construction management or project management, uh, partnering, alliancing, and joint ventures, all PPPs, are all considered by Acumen, the architecture practice notes, uh, to be alternative methods. Okay, alternative methods. So, so uh, in terms of architects, um, of course, uh, Acumen, written by the Australian Institute of Architects, um, is a uh, is going to always privilege architects. It's always going to be about architects. But we need to remember that there are other forms of procurement that may involve architects in different relationships or may not involve architects um, at all. So. One of the things that uh, the AIA through Acumen actually um, talks about in terms of alternative procurement methods um, is, uh, as a reason I suppose for not doing them, is uh, uh, lack of independent assessment. In other words, architects don't control things because architects believe themselves to be independent. Um, uh, the uh, effect of uh, contractors or builders' profitability on consultants' fees or architects fees, um, the different relationships uh, um, that uh, put uh, the uh, architect in a point of weakness in terms of the design team in, in, uh, relative to the builder and the client, um, uh, accessibility to the client, so architects feel it's very important to have access to the client uh, and not all procurement methods allow this, and also um, in alternative systems, are the responsibility and liability of uh, all parties involved clearly defined because they're not the usual things that architects deal with. So, um, I'll now take you through uh, those uh, five systems, um, but I'll say that uh, most of these slides actually come from Robin Hardy's uh, 2016 lecture for this unit. Robin used to teach in uh, uh, BCN uh, in our faculty and uh, has now uh, uh, retired. So the first one is the uh, uh, traditional um, system of procurement, uh, which is also known as a lump sum contract or a design uh, bid uh, build system. So this uh, in each of these, I will go through. Um, the processes, what you can see here, then the relationships, and then we'll go through uh, the advantages and disadvantages of, of that system. So the process here essentially is that uh, you design the thing until um, with your client until uh, it's, the design is, is what your client can accept, and then you put it up uh, for, for uh, tender or for costing, which is the bid part, so people, builders will bid on your on your designs through your documents and then based on that you will engage uh, the builder to, to construct the, the project. So the relationship between uh, the uh, main groups in this is, is that uh, the architect um, has a contract with the uh, client as you can see here. Yeah. So these solid lines are contractual uh, relationship and, uh, and the dashed lines are a communications uh, uh, relationship. So what you can see here is that the architect is contracted to the clients and to the subconsultants or the specialist consultants, um, and then the client has also got a contractual relationship. Has also got a contractual relationship with the builder or contractor. Yeah. But note that the client does not have a communications uh, link with the contractor, and that all communications needs actually to go through the architect, who will then relay it back to the client. Okay. And then the subcontractors are contracted by the contractor, uh, as well as, as communi communicating with the uh, with the uh, with the uh, contractor. So you can see here that the the subconsultants or specialist consultants, if they want to talk to the subcontractors, they basically have to communicate to the architect because that's their communications link, who will then tell the contractor, who will then tell the the subcontractors that uh, information is needed or what have you. Um, so all of these relationships are, are then uh, set out uh, within within the, the contract of, of the system. Um, <clears throat> so uh, these kinds of uh, traditional methods of procure this kind of traditional method is commonly used for. Uh, bespoke projects where design is important. 
And in this case, uh, the architect acts as the agent of the client in administering a contract or the superintendent of, of, the, of the project. Uh, slightly alternative uh, variation uh, to the traditional method of procurement is, is essentially when the consultants are actually contracted by the architect. So in that case, we go back to two weeks ago's lecture where you get a group of consultants that are that are hired by the client with the architect as the lead consultant. Okay, so the only thing that changes here is that the uh, contractual link is uh, of the consultants is with the architect, not with the client. Now, um, the advantages of this traditional method is, is that um, uh, the uh, designer uh, works with the client um, on the design um, in terms of uh, its function, its qualities, uh, there's a very clear briefing uh, system mm -hmm. and all of these things that, that we've heard about in previous lectures uh, before it is put out for, for costing. So by the time you, you put it out for price, um, your documents are quite well developed, uh, if not 99% uh, developed, um, which then leads to reasonable price certainty. Okay, So this is a good thing. For the client because they know that it's it's not going to change uh, very much at all uh, outside of um, standard uh, um, things that you don't know about that you might not know about the other thing is that uh, all the procedures for these kinds of, of uh, for this kind of method is, is known in terms of the contract in terms of the communications uh, the forms and what have you and these are all very established things the uh, AIA um, uh, and, and many other construction-led uh, NGOs uh, have standard forms that can be used by people uh, when they go through the traditional procurement method. Um, and changes and variations are usually due to, to the client uh, um, changing their, their mind about certain things, well, well within their rights to do so, or, or technology changing uh, over the period of construction. Yeah, so, so everything is, is mostly known. Uh, you do want to allow for some contingencies uh, in this method, uh, but uh, you don't have to allow for a lot in terms of, of what has been decided upon. Um, there are also disadvantages, though. It's not a perfect system. Uh, so what happens is that um, if uh, the client is in a huge rush and uh, incomplete documents are put out for costing, then uh, which, which happens uh, more often than one would think, what you would think, then uh, you, there's a risk of, of, um, of, of what will happen with the underdeveloped documentation. Um, so what happens is that the builder has to take a guess and doesn't really know until they actually start building as to how much it's actually going to cost. Um, what, it, what it then also means is that um, uh, it is, uh, the, the process is sequential, which means that it can't go very fast when you need to go fast. Um, and uh, the other thing, of course, is that because the builder is not involved in the process, uh, the process is actually uh, slowed down. So if the builder is involved right from the beginning, everything can actually be sped up. But uh, you uh, can understand that the builder, before their contract, that might not actually want to be very um, involved in, in these matters. So uh, you may find uh, situations where the builder takes advantage of the client's need for speed. Um, and will purposely underquote and certain things that they know will probably cost more to get the client on board and then during the process uh, say, okay, well, you know, this is going to go up by 30% uh, because uh, of inadequate documentation, even though they may have promised that, uh, that this would not happen. So um, the other thing is, is uh, when you don't have a good set of documents, a uh, complete set of documents, you can't accurately um, estimate what the uh, profit margins of the builders are. Moving right on to uh, design and construct, uh, or the design and build method. And so um, what happens here is, is basically that you can see that uh, the design and construct uh, um, part actually is on the right uh, on the right side of that arrow. So you don't design anything until someone someone has been signed up. Okay. Um, so the feasibility is is really something that is very very sketchy, 
uh, and uh, and really you're, you're you're telling the builder that uh, that what you want uh, um, you you telling giving the builder only of a very vague idea of what you want, and and you actually need to. Uh, need to be much more on top of it yourself as a client because you don't have the architect acting for you. So what happens in a design construct procurement method is that the client um, contacts the contractor directly and enters into a contract with them to, to build something based on the client's brief. The contractor then goes to um, get the architects and consultants um, and, and also uh, uh, gets the subcontractors uh, as per normal, but you can see from this diagram that the client has no direct access then to, to the architect and the consultants. So um, this system is mostly used uh, for government and in the government and commercial sectors, uh, but also for housing. So uh, what happens is, is this suits, um, this suits uh, organizations that are uh, large and keep doing the same thing and they have very developed uh, briefing systems or existing briefs uh, in order to, to tell the builder uh, what they need uh, and then the builder then goes and gets an architect to design it uh, and, and, and as well at the same time they will build it. Um, in, smaller, in smaller scales, uh, what we call uh, uh, builder's homes is also part of this, of this system. So when you buy a a, a project house, you go to a builder and say, I want one of your houses. You don't talk to the architect at all. And uh, the design documentation, permits, etc., is actually built into the system or built into the price. Um, design and construct uh, contracts do not form, form part of the uh, AIA's published form of contracts, um, but an architect may be involved as a consultant to the builder. Um, uh, or as a consultant to the owner. So, so what that means is, is that they're not essential to the process and they may not even be involved in, in such a process. So uh, for, the, for the architect then it's important to know exactly what their role is and what their contract is uh, with uh, each of the parties here and to know what their level of influence might be. Yeah, because uh, um, you, you, uh, you certainly uh, may not be uh, uh, designing uh, may not have the same um, relationship with your client uh, when in design because your client is the builder and they have uh, different uh, uh, they, they're interested in different outcomes so the builder may be more interested in profitability uh, rather than the client who's interested in the, in the in the end product now this is a simplification and uh, while I know there are many builders who are interested in in the, in the level of finish um, it is not uh, our tradition uh, to be uh, for builders to, to actually be interested in, in very fine construction. Most of them are interested in profitability. Architects, of course, are, are, are no, no better in, in this way, I should say, at this point. So I'm not trying to paint architects as angels and builders as devils. Now, um, this does not necessarily mean, though, that you end up with, uh, with bad architecture. Uh, it really depends on the context. So in terms of our context, the results are generally not good. But we must remember that this is a very standard way of procuring architecture in, in uh, other places. So in Japan, um, the client will go directly to the builder. The builder that will then go to, to, to an architect, including all those architects that, that we that we study. So that's what's interesting is that they have a different um, tradition of construction and architecture and the architect is very key to, to this process. So the builder would never think about building anything without the architect and the client will trust that the builder will go and get a good architect. So so a lot of those Japanese projects we look at, you know, Sejima, Ando, um, and Tange before them, all of them went through this process. They were actually contracted to the builder rather than the, rather than the clients, and uh, the same thing in, in Europe. Uh, a lot of the times when when Calatrava is involved, uh, Cal he's actually been uh, appointed by the builder rather than the clients. So it does not mean necessarily that you're going to end up with bad architecture. It just depends on what the tradition of construction is within a certain context. So um, in design and construct. Um, the good things about it is that the client deals with just one body rather than the traditional part where they have to deal with uh, uh, 
um, the architect uh, and the builder, but through the architect. And uh, the other thing is that it's also a good, generally good for a project to have the builder um, involved in, in the design and planning of a project, because then you're actually not uh, doing double work, which you might do in a traditional system where you design and document something and the builder might get you to change everything because they have a better idea, uh, which often they do. Um, and uh, there is certainly price certainty, uh, but um, it depends on the quality of the brief. Uh, so if you've, if you've given the uh, builder a bad brief, uh, then there, there may be open the variations. Um, uh, so that's an advantage and a disadvantage. Um, uh, and of course, uh, there's a reduced uh, project time because everything is only being done once. It's not being uh, designed once and then assessed another time by builder. Everything's being done at the same time. There's, there's sort of uh, reduced uh, uh, doubling up of, of activities and, and time. Um, Sorry, price certainty. Let me just go back to that. So price certainty, if you have a decent enough brief, there's, a, there's very good price certainty on these kinds of, of, of projects. So the disadvantages are that uh, you need a very comprehensive brief to be able to, to get a good outcome out of this, um, especially with uh, projects for which there are no standard designs. The client needs to commit to the design concept early before the design uh, detailed design is completed. Um, and uh, so um, that means that they can't have the luxury of actually slowly working through a design uh, reflectively with an architect. Uh, the uh, bids uh, between uh, design and construct bidders may be difficult to compare because you're not working off a standard set of documents as you would in a traditional way. Um, the design overview is, is uh, not done by, by the architect uh, or the client, it's actually done by the builder. Uh, so the client doesn't have a lot of effect, a, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, involvement in the design apart from saying I like it or I don't. Um, any changes that happen after a contract has been signed um, can be very expensive and um, also uh, the design liability uh, is, is limited on this. So what clients need to know, the clients need to know what they want early uh, as there's very little flexibility and in many ways uh, this whole process is stacked against the clients. Uh, they don't know what the builder's profit margins are um, and in fact they, the clients need to be heavily involved uh, uh, up front to, during the briefing period to make sure that they get what they want. So moving on, the next system is called uh, construction management or, or project management. So you can see with, with, uh, with the diagram here, uh, what happens is that, um, is that uh, uh, there is uh, up front, there is, uh, you get a project manager or construction manager involved as well as an architect. Yeah? And, and they all work together through the design uh, phase. Um, and then uh, the, the, the project is, is then uh, procured or then contracts go out and then the thing is, is built. So essentially uh, what this is is that uh, the uh, construction manager um, takes on the role um, uh, of the builder, takes on uh, much of the role of the builder um, much early on. Yeah, But what uh, this... Um, uh, process is, is characterized by is that the uh, construction manager is, is essentially working as the builder for the client, uh, but without actually um, uh, doing uh, any of the building. So in other words, they are working for a, a wage rather than for profit, and they're organizing all of the construction on behalf uh, of, the, of the client, um, but the client pays uh, the uh, subcontractors and, and, and for materials and what have you, and the contractors pay the client di uh, directly. So, so in other words, you're getting all the expertise of the managerial and organizational expertise of a builder, uh, and you're paying them a good salary, but you don't have to worry about um, the uh, profit margin uh, of the builder, and, and you'll know exactly what, what you're paying for for every aspect of the construction. Um, so, in other words, uh, 
the uh, this builder provides provides management services only to to the client, and the provision of materials and labor is through a series of different um, contracts uh, between the uh, client and the different contractors and subcontractors. Um, so the construction manager still uh, supervises the construction and manages the uh, construction services uh, provided by the design consultants, including the architect. Um, and uh, so this system is, is really good for, for large projects because they're much more transparent. So the client body gets to see every single contract for every single aspect of the construction. Um, and... Um, and uh, the other thing is that it is uh, not an adversarial system because really you have the builder that's working for the clients uh, rather than against the clients. Uh, this used to be the role of, of the architect, of course, uh, in, in some cases. Uh, but uh, it, as you have uh, someone who's, who's, uh, who's uh, dealing with their expertise, uh, it, it, um, it is also a good thing for the architect because they get to deal with uh, the person managing the construction from an early phase. Um, so I've been through that uh, the project construction manager is the you know uh, works on behalf of the client or principal. Um, this also means that the, the client does not have to actually be involved in day to day construction, um, uh, and and the, the, they brought on early. I've spoken about that. Um, now, uh, one of the big advantages here is, is similar to the design and construct process in that the management contractor or the contract manager is, is brought on for the whole process and from an early um, uh, phase of, of, the, of the process so that uh, there's lots of time saving potential um, and, uh, and that design and construction can overlap. Okay, so once you take that adversarial thing of the architect fee the builder out, then uh, things can happen uh, much more smoothly and, and certainly out of uh, sequence that you would in a, in a traditional, um, traditional way. Uh, if there's any changes to be made, these can be easily managed because really you're going step by step through the thing uh, rather than uh, having uh, to make wholesale changes when uh, in the construction when the design um, change comes up. Um, and uh, also, uh, this can mean that things can proceed at, at quite a fast pace because you're, you're not having to lock yourself into any sort of contractual um, limitations in terms of the construction. Now, um, architects uh, used to act as construction managers. Uh, we talked about the uh, Abbott Sujet before. Um, and if we think back to Florida Hotels v. Mayo, which is the one where the pool collapsed when the uh, when the uh, um, formwork was taken over was taken off too early. In that case, the architect was actually acting as the construction manager. Was actually acting as as the the builder, the person who arranged for for contractors to come and do stuff. And this is of course not uh, unusual. Um, if we think of Rudolf Schindler, do we know who Rudolf Schindler is? Schindler and Neutra. Schindler and Neutra were, were um, students of, of uh, Wagner's in, in uh, Vienna uh, who were um, uh, interested in American uh, modernism and went off to work for Frank Lloyd Wright in, in LA. Um, and they worked on, on various buildings in, in the, uh, on the Barnstall House uh, that Wright designed in LA and then later went out and did their, did their, uh, opened their own firms. So both of them were, were significant uh, early 20th century modernist architects in LA who were doing these beautiful uh, modern houses. Now Schindler very much worked uh, in, in that way. Schindler very much worked as the construction manager. So he arranged for everything to be built uh, to his design on behalf of his clients. So in, in a way he was really the architect and builder at one um, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, ended up with uh, really interesting um, outcomes. His his house uh, on Kings uh, Kings Road in in, uh, in Hollywood is, is an interesting one because he actually built that himself and used that system to to continue on. So um, uh, really amazing architect, one of my favorites. So you might, uh, I, but I digress. You might go and look at him if you're interested in in someone a little bit different. Um,
Kavok likes him too, which is unusual that we like the same thing, but never mind. Um, okay, now the disadvantages is uh, in, of the construction management or project management uh, system is that uh, really the client needs to be sure that they're going to go down this pathway because they're going to put in a, a lot of resources uh, to get the thing done. They need a very uh, good quality brief, so they need to know what they want. Um, uh, the other thing is that uh, costings, uh, are, you can't be sure of costings until the end uh, because this is something that you can have estimates of, but, but you can't be sure because no one is going to be responsible for that except for the clients. Um, and you also need a, a committed uh, team so that you uh, uh, end up with, with the outcomes that, that, you, that you want. Um, there's a lot of uh, paperwork for the client because the client has to deal with every single contractor that's working on the project. And uh, if there's any delays in anything, at the end of the day, uh, the client is responsible rather than the builder or, or the consultants. Um, the other thing is that uh, this construction manager or project manage manager needs very much to be part of the process much earlier on than, than, uh, than uh, uh, to, to make this thing work properly. Um, and uh, that the risk is all taken uh, by, the, by the clients. Um, uh, you really need also a different set of, of, uh, of uh, reporting systems or communications protocols to other procurement systems. And this needs to be quite full on in order to make sure that everybody is uh, on the same page and, and that the client has confidence that things are happening uh, Properly. But this really means that the client really needs to be on top of, of this uh, and there's a lot of work for them. So generally it's, it's uh, larger corporations and organizations that deal with these sorts of systems. Now the next one is uh, partnering joint ventures and strategic alliances. This is an unusual one because uh, in this procurement method all stakeholders have an equal part and responsibility. Uh, in, in the project. It's a collaborative system where everybody works together to get the project implemented. Uh, one of its main characteristics is that it's not adversarial. Um, and the nature um, of... Uh, uh, this is uh, interesting in view of the nature that most uh, uh, construction contracts are adversarial, uh, as I spoke about before. Uh, so rather than signatories always trying to get the better of... Uh, other um, people in the uh, in the contract um, really uh, in this uh, in this uh, system what it is uh, the, what its main feature is that is that all people uh, sign off at the beginning that they're actually going to to work together so everybody is involved as a signatory to the project um, in in partnering uh, integrated teams for design and construction so so you get um, so you get uh, all the, the advantages of the contract management system that we just talked about then, but all the contractors themselves are actually all, uh, all involved in, uh, as well. Um, it's an open book supply chain, so everybody body knows what's going on, everybody can see what's going on, and everything is, is really open. So it makes it much, uh, much uh, easier to have confidence in the system. You just have to decide that, that that is okay for you and and and, uh, and go uh, forward. So uh, you can also agree to to have uh, to have uh, uh, incentives uh, for for better performance. So you can set a baseline amongst all the partners, and if that is uh, exceeded, then there can be incentives uh, from the project uh, being fed back to the different people who are involved in the thing. Um, the uh, Belconnen Community Centre, that one, the, the new one on the uh, on the lake down there, uh, was was uh, built uh, with a with a partnering uh, uh, procurement system. So, uh, really, when you have everybody who decides to work together in a very open way, you have a much uh, improved prospect of, of success uh, for the project uh, because basically you've got people who are. Who are committing not to not to fight with each other and actually to work with each other. Um, there's savings in time and cost because no one is busily trying to cover their butts or trying to cover their sins. 
Um, and generally what seems to happen is, is that uh, you get good value for money uh, with a better product and, and most importantly uh, reduced uh, disputes. However, this can't just happen. What you need is, is that you need a cultural and ethical fit between all of, of the uh, partners. So if any one of those partners uh, does not uh, really agree to this system, then, then it's not going to work. Um, uh, those, all those partners need to uh, develop the team together. They need to trust each other and... Uh, and uh, you, have, uh, you need to have holistic management approaches which, which includes everybody or, which, or for which uh, everybody uh, can be included. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about joint ventures and alliances, this is, uh, you can see that in this list here, it's exactly the same as, as partnering. Uh, the only thing is, is that in a joint venture, you've got a, a new corporate entity that is um, that is formed uh, where everybody is uh, where everybody is, is a shareholder essentially. So in partnering, you just agree to do it together. Uh, in in uh, joint ventures and alliances, you actually um, have a corporate structure to organise that rather than just all signing a contract to say that, that you're doing it. Um, the uh, features otherwise are the same, and, and you can see here that the uh, requirements are the same uh, between joint ventures and alliances. Uh, and partnering, um, and uh, the uh, the uh, but the benefits uh, are, are slightly diff different here. So um, a lot of what uh, Alan Green was talking about last week was really about uh, well, he was talking about joint ventures and alliances. So it allows uh, for for um, organisations that work, uh, that don't usually work on on that scale of project to be able to to. Uh, get in on it so they can pull resources to do bigger projects um, and of course this this kind of system there's always a cross fertilization of ideas and there's uh, uh, greater levels of innovation that are available uh, that are possible and of course uh, good things can happen to to uh, uh, to to all of those uh, who are involved um, but there's no risk, uh, in, there's no, I suppose the, the, the reason why this isn't done more is because uh, the amount of money one can make is, is, is fixed. Yeah, it's, it's the, the outcomes uh, are fixed, so, so there's, there's uh, you can't be greedy. If, you, if you're going to be greedy and, and go in wanting to get too much out of it, uh, you won't be part of it. So it, it's no good if you want to, to uh, um, make uh, a lot of profit for not a lot of effort. It's not suitable for, for, for those kinds of uh, things. So the final thing that I'll talk about today, the final procurement system I'll talk about today is uh, public-private partnerships. Um, uh, and there's many different kinds of public partners, PPP models, uh, but specifically I'll talk about the, uh, uh, the, the boot model. Uh, so, boot basically means build, own, operate, transfer. Um, these are becoming more and more common for large, large uh, infrastructure uh, projects uh, initiated by governments, but also large architectural projects initiated, initiated by governments. So, really what we're talking about here is, is uh, toll roads and, and certain uh, large buildings, uh, which I'll show you one uh, on the next slide. Um, now, uh, essentially what happens uh, with this system is that it is a service contract between the government and, and, and a private uh, consortium um, where the government basically tells this private consortium what they want um, and then the private consortium uh, raises the funds to, to go and uh, um, build and run uh, the project over a long period, uh, more than 20 years. Um, and uh, um, under certain conditions, so, so the facility has to uh, be um, open 24 hours a day, etc., etc., or whatever the conditions may be. Um, and no payments um, are made uh, uh, to the government or, or by the government. Um, sorry, no payments are made until the, the facility is available for operation. So that's, that's a kind of finance thing. And... Um, the government uh, will, will make uh, payments to the operator over the contract life. So basically, the, co the government is slowly paying, uh, you know, dribbling um, 
uh, uh, money to, to the uh, operator, really like paying rent uh, for, for something to happen. Uh, it, it's really a lease, I suppose, at the end of the day. And eventually the government will take back ownership of, of that facility. Okay, so, so for the government, uh, what the, um, what the uh, advantage uh, is, um, is that uh, the government does not have to um, come up with all the money at the beginning. Um, uh, they don't, of course, uh, need to make a profit on it, but then that's not the role of governments to make profits on things anyway. And at the end of the day, they have the facility uh, given back to them. So um, a lot of things, in the, like in the case of a toll rule, have to be agreed with the government uh, as part of the PPP contract, um, such as tolls and what have you, and including uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, the rates uh, that uh, the public will be charged to use it and, and so on and so forth. Um, now, the... Uh, so at the end of the day, the government has to make a decision as to as to uh, how they're going to pay for it and allow the private consortium to make a profit on it. So at the end of the day, they uh, actually uh, the government doesn't pay as much as if they actually put the whole thing together themselves. But um, uh, they uh, don't always have total control over what that private consortium charges. Now. Um, so when you've got this, uh, this relationship here, you can see that, um, that really you've, you've got this, the, the main uh, consortium that, that, that builds uh, the thing, um, and they're in a the direct relationship, builds and operates the thing, they're in direct relationship with the government, um, and, and then they go and get the financing, and they operate it, and they organize for the construction. So this building here, the Melbourne uh, uh, Convention and Exhibition Centre uh, by, by NH Architecture and uh, uh, Brookfield Multiplex and the whole stack of other people involved is, is an example of that. Now the thing that is missing from, from this picture is, is, uh, is, is the architect. Okay, So the architect is, is, is actually buried inside here. The architect is actually buried inside there. So the architect um, uh, actually uh, Works for for the consortium uh, during uh, the uh, uh, during the uh, once the uh, public private partnership contract has been issued, but um, one of the uh, features of this uh, of this relationship is that quite often the architect needs to work uh, with uh, the client with the government to to be able to to get the the project up. So what will happen typically like with the, the Melbourne Convention Centre is that you had five different consortia uh, who were interested in it. And what then happened is the architects from each of those uh, consortia were actually working directly with the government in competition with each other, doing an architectural competition to, 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 uh, to uh, fulfil the brief. The client then um, uh, awarded the project to, to one of the architects and, their, uh, the, and uh, to one of the consortiums and paid off the architect. Then the architects went to work for the consortium. So you can see in, in this case, uh, they were novated. So what novation is, is that uh, it just means that the architect works for one um, organization in the beginning of the project and, and the second organization um, uh, as the project, uh, as the construction project is, or as the contract is, is signed here. So that's that's called uh, novation. Yeah. Um, so that is uh, that is probably the most complicated thing that that uh, architects would actually be able to be uh, involved in in terms of procurement. Um, and uh, the stakes are very high for these things. Like um, out of the five, um, if we look at this uh, if, this project here. There were five architects that, that actually uh, uh, put in bids for this, very detailed bids, um, uh, bids uh, detailed enough so that uh, it, so that uh, um, the government would know how much the thing was going to cost. Um, and you can imagine uh, how much that cost. Uh, um, NH told me that they spent uh, 1.2 million uh, of, of their own money on this. And they want it, so so basically that they can then get that money back uh, through the actual project itself. But think about the other four architecture firms that went for it. Each of them spending one to one point five million. 
So it's a big investment and a big risk. And and um, at the end of the day, uh, if you don't win the the, the project, that's one point five million dollars down the drain. You don't get it back. Um, so swings and roundabouts. Um, big architecture firms go. Uh, for these kinds of, of projects, because uh, they bank on, on getting uh, they bank on getting one of these uh, contracts every now and again. Okay, so if you if you can't go into it, uh, if you can't stand to lose uh, the amount of money it costs to put one of these things together, then then you shouldn't be uh, part of it. But this is this is just absolute capitalism gone mad, if you ask me. But um, uh, uh, you're not asking me, so I want to uh, expand on that. Um, okay. Uh, are there any questions to do with this part? No? Okay, very good. And look, we can talk about it. If you think of uh, something else, um, if you think of something about this uh, uh, during, uh, you know, we can always talk about it during uh, a tutorial. So um, the next... Uh, Assignment. Next assignment. The next uh, lecture is is going to be about.